Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem, find x sum of all k long subarrays one. So there's some good news and some bad news with this problem. The good news is that actually, I think the brute force solution is about as optimal as we can get. There are some more other solutions, but they're really not any more optimal. I'll try to show you why. Uh, but the bad news is that even this brute force solution, I'm not gonna lie, is pretty tricky dicky. Like for an easy problem, this is a pretty tricky problem, but I found it pretty interesting and hopefully you will as well. Let's get into it. So if you're anything like me, the first question you're probably thinking is what is this problem even asking for? It's kind of complicated. So assume we're given an input array like this one. It's not necessarily going to be, I mean, this isn't in sorted order, but yeah, it's not going to be necessarily in sorted order. And we're going to be given a couple of parameters. K is going to be six in this case and X is going to be two. Let me try to help you understand how to read these sorts of problems. So first of all, I'm going to start actually at the bottom because they give us like this definition up above but the most important thing is down here where they say that we want to return an integer array answer of this length where each value is going to correspond to some subarray in this uh, input array over here where the subarray is going to look something like this now keep in mind i is a variable so like we have a array starting at i and then it's going to end at i plus k minus one. I know k is a variable, but it's actually a constant, right? It's not going to change or anything like that. So what this tells us is let's just plug some math in. Let's say i is zero, zero here. And let's say k is six. So I get zero plus uh, six minus one. This will turn into a five. So we're looking at this subarray. In this case, it's going to look like this one from zero all the way to index five. So that's one such subarray. What would the next one be? Well, let's say we are at i equals one, then this is gonna be just six, right? Because the only thing we changed is i, nothing else changed. So now it's starting to look like a sliding window, right? We're gonna look at this subarray, we're gonna look at this subarray, and then finally we're gonna look at that subarray. I guess we could try to start over here, but it doesn't really work, right? We go out of bounds. So at that point we can stop. So this shows us there were three subarrays. And you know what they told us over here, that the answer array is always gonna be of this length, n minus k plus a one. Well, if you take the length of this array, I think you get eight. So you get eight minus six plus one, that's three. That's not a coincidence. That's always gonna be the case. That formula is correct. They didn't lie to us. So now that we have like this out of the way, I think that was probably one of the harder things to understand if you're a beginner. Now I'm gonna get into what they're actually talking about over here. Because for each of these subarrays, we need to do something particular. We need to, among these K elements, we need to track the top X most frequent of them. So probably we should use some kind of data structure to count like a hash map to do that for us. I think an array would actually also work in this problem because I believe the input numbers here are constrained, I think from one to 50. So it's like somewhere in that range. So only 50 different like unique possibilities for each integer. So if you want to, you can use an array, but I'm probably going to use a hash map. Um, anyways, we want to track those most frequent elements, the X uh, most frequent elements. In this case, X is equal to two. And then the way they word this is interesting. They say calculate the sum of the resulting array because they have like this little story in the problem that they're talking about. Like you take these elements, you filter out the top X most frequent of them, and then you calculate the sum. But don't let like the wording of that confuse you. We're basically just saying that like in this subarray over here, what are the most frequent elements? Well, one and two. And if we were looking for more than two, we would keep going. But these are the top two most frequent uh, elements. And then we just take the sum of all of these elements. So there's two occurrences of one. That's going to give us a two. Uh, two occurrences of two. That's going to give us a plus four. So in total, we get six. So that's why you see a six in the output for the first value. Now I'm going to keep going with like this dry run because it's going to basically help us understand the rest of the description where they say here, like what happens if there's a tie and stuff like that. I think that's easiest to understand when you're actually going through an example. So if you got stuck on this problem and you didn't try to a uh, dry run this, assuming you did understand what the problem was asking for, I would highly recommend you do that next time. Maybe you won't even have to watch this video. 
and then maybe you'll help me go out of business. But anyways, looking at the second subarray over here, what are the most frequent elements? Well, there's three occurrences of two, so definitely that one. And then what's next? Because we still need two most frequent elements. Well, it looks like there's a tie. We have a one, we have a three, and we have a four. So when there's a tie, what should we do? Well, they tell us over here, if elements have the same number of occurrences, choose the one with the biggest value. I guess we're being greedy. So that's fine with us. Which one of these do we pick? Of course, the four. So for this second subarray, we get three occurrences of two and a four. That's going to give us a total sum of 10. That's why you see 10 over there. Now, lastly, we're going to uh, do this subarray. And there are, I believe, three occurrences of two and two occurrences of three. There's only one occurrence of four, so we will stick with these ones. And I think we get a total sum of 12. That's why you see 12 over here. I kind of just did it like on pen and paper. I didn't really show you what algorithm we're going to be using. So there's a few ideas uh, to think of. First, you might think that a sliding window is definitely going to help us make this more efficient. And it's not that a sliding window is bad in this case. It's not going to make it less efficient, but I'm actually going to show you that a sliding window is not going to help us in this case, because the whole idea behind the sliding window is that like if we were doing a brute force, it would look like this. We iterate over all of these. OK, then we restart. We iterate from all of these. Then we restart over here iterate over all of these. And so a sliding window is supposed to eliminate that repeated work, all that repeated work you see here in the middle. But here's why that's not going to happen. Because let's say we're doing it the brute force way. So I look at this subarray and let's say I have my hash map. Let's say I call it count and then one has an occurrence of two, like two times it shows up and then two shows up twice and then three and four show up once each. So how exactly are we going to get the top X most frequent values from here? Well, unless I missed it, unless there's a better way to do this, I'm pretty sure you're just going to have to take all of these keys or actually all of these keys. We're sorting based on the count and then just sort right in this case. They're already in sorted order, but that's not always going to be the case. So we want to sort by the count in descending order because we want the most frequent ones first. But in case there's a tie, we actually want to then sort them by the values. Python makes this really easy. That's why I always recommend people use Python. I think Java also makes it pretty doable, and I think C++ as well. I'm not really sure about JavaScript, but I, I think it's actually doable in that as well. What I'm going to do in Python is I'm going to sort uh, this. I'm going to make it into a list of pairs. So let's say each pair is going to look like the uh, number and the count. And then I'm going to sort based on the count first and then the number second. So this is going to take precedence. But if there's a tie between the count, then the number with the bigger value, which in this case is two, is going to go before one. So after we do that sorting, this uh, list of pairs should look something like this, where we have two mapping to two, one mapping to two, four mapping to one, and then three mapping to one. And once you have that mapping, well, then you can just go through them in descending order and you only need the top X of them. So we can stop after we see two of them. In this case, we get these two. And then how do we do the computation? Well, we say we have two occurrences of the value two. multiply these guys together. We get four. Next, we have two occurrences of one multiply them together, we get two. So add those together, we get a total sum of six. So that's what it takes to process a single subarray. And to summarize, what did we have to do? Well, we had to iterate over that. So we had to iterate over a size of K. That's not too bad times K. What else did we have to do with this subarray? Well, we had to sort it. So that's going to be K log K, assuming we use some kind of efficient sorting algorithm. So between these two, looks like the bottleneck is going to be the second one. These wouldn't be multiplied, by the way. You'd add these to get the time complexity of processing this single subarray. So you get rid of this K. We don't really care about it because this one's bigger anyway. And how many times are we going to have to do that? Well, how many subarrays are we going to have? That's going to depend on, remember, the formula that they gave us here. N minus K. So the overall time complexity doing this in the brute force way is going to be K log 
k multiplied by n minus k. I guess you can have the plus one, but it doesn't really matter. So there we go. I guess I'll keep the plus one because I'm actually not 100% sure if it matters because I know this will be multiplied with that. But anyways, that's not going to be the important bit. This is the brute force time complexity. And it's important to analyze this because intuitively you'd think sliding window would be better, but let me show you why it's actually not. It's going to be the exact same as this. And the reason for that is because as I showed earlier, remember the term K, we had that plus we had this term, but we realized that that plus K, it was irrelevant because we have to sort it anyway. So it doesn't really matter that we had to iterate over all of this. So the sliding window, which is supposed to eliminate that K term, which yes, it, it does do that, but it doesn't really change the overall time complexity because even with the sliding window, we still have to sort that subarray. So it's not going to get rid of this term and we still have to look at every single subarray. So there's going to be this many subarrays. So the sliding window approach is going to be a little bit more complicated, but not really more efficient. You can code it up if you'd like. There's nothing wrong with it, but I'm not going to do that. So let me code this up now. By the way, I'm going to use some uh, Python tips and tricks in this video. If you're not familiar with them, you might consider checking out my Python for Coding Interviews course. It shows you pretty much everything you need to know about DSA related to Python. So I'm going to have a result array. I know they called theirs answer, but I usually use this convention. And we're going to return that as well. And then we're going to do something pretty simple. We're going to start at every index i in the input array. But we know that we don't actually have to start at every single beginning because let's say we have something like this. Let's say I have one, two, three, four. So an array of four elements. Let's say my K was three. So I would look at this subarray starting at the first element, starting at the second element, and then we're done. So how many times do we iterate? Well, it's going to be length minus K plus one. Length minus K plus one one. So that'll give us every valid beginning. And then after that, what we want to do is starting at I, we want that subarray, we want that slice. And Python lets us slice it pretty easily, starting at index I, going to I plus K. So that's the subarray. And Python also lets us transform this into a hash map, getting the count of each element very easily. You just pass that into the counter constructor. This is basically a hash map and I'm going to call that count. Then I'm going to do a couple things because one thing I didn't actually mention is that what if we had an array of something like this? Let's say one, 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 and then four. And let's say K is still equal to three and X is equal to two. That means we're looking at subarrays of size three, but we want the top two most frequent elements. Well, what if there's only one element in the subarray in total? How do we get the top two most frequent ones? Well, they tell us that we don't have to do that. In the description, they say something like, um, note that if an array has less than X distinct elements, the X sum is the sum of the array itself. That makes sense. They're basically just saying you don't have to get the top X frequent elements. If there's only one of them, just use that element. So to make that easy for us, we don't have to do any sorting in that case. We just take the sum of the subarray itself. In this case, that would be this. So how do we know if that's the case? Well, since we passed these into the hash map, the hash map will deduplicate the keys for us. So what we can say is get the length of that hash map. And if the number of keys is less than or actually even equal to X, well, then we can just take the sum of the entire subarray from I to I plus K. And then we can just append that to the result for this pass. Now, if that's not the case, that's where the interesting stuff is gonna happen. That's where the sorting stuff is gonna happen. So mostly this part, if you like know the Python libraries and stuff, this part is trivial. If you don't, I'll show you how to do it right now. What we're gonna do is take the uh, hash map and get items. So that's gonna basically give us a bunch of pairs. We're gonna transform that into a list of pairs and uh, we're gonna do this. We're gonna assign it to that. And then we want to sort these pairs. We can do that like this. We can do it multiple ways, but this is one way to do it, pairs.sort. And we want to have like our custom sort. So the key that we're gonna pass is going to be a lambda function, an inline function, where let's call the parameter n, or let's call it p for pair. And how we're gonna sort is going to be like this. We want to take the pair's second value, which is gonna be the count, the first value is going to be the original number. That's just the convention that like this uses count.items from a hash map. 
We also want it to be in descending order. We could reverse this afterwards, or we could just pass in the parameter reverse equal true. It's probably better. And then now we have the pairs in descending order. Remember what we're going to do after that. We're just going to iterate over the first uh, x of them and then get the total sum of them. So I'm going to call this variable current sum. I'm going to iterate over the pairs from the beginning to the x index. And um, I'm just going to unpack the pair like this, num count in pairs. And then I'm going to add to the current sum the number multiplied by the count. After all that's done, result append current sum. Okay, that is pretty much it. I know this looks more fancy than it is. That's because Python is pretty uh, nice and neat, at least once you're familiar with it. So I highly recommend like practicing this stuff if you're not. But running it, you can see here, it is very efficient. If you found this helpful, check out Neatcode.io for a lot more. Thanks for watching. I'll see you soon.